We're back, and here's Tony with a look at the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. The Cutlass has always been a top seller for GM, but in recent times it's lost ground to the Honda Accord and other rivals. Fitting the Cutlass into a market slot is no easy task because there are three models bearing the same name, all on different platforms. Our test car was a Cutlass Supreme International, not to be confused with a Cutlass Calais or a Cutlass Sierra. I'm not quite sure why Oldsmobile feels it needs three Cutlasses on its roster, and I'm convinced there's quite a bit of confusion out in the marketplace. Who knows, maybe this is why Cutlasses don't sell as well as they used to. The Supreme is based on a similar platform to other GM10 cars like the Chevrolet Lumina, Pontiac Grand Prix and Buick Regal. First introduced as a coupe, the Supreme is now available with four doors, and that's what we tested for driver's seat. The international badge on our Cutlass denotes a package of goodies to set it apart from lesser models. GM's plan to make cars in its various divisions less similar, despite common basic features, is working well. Although this car is nearly identical to its Chevrolet, Pontiac and Buick counterparts, it has its own personality. Following GM's current styling theme, the Supreme has lots of window glass, a low-set aerodynamic nose and a high roomy trunk. It's a great looking car and owners will find it combines worthwhile sportiness with excellent family hauling capabilities. I didn't like the blacked out tail panel, but that's just a personal thing. I did like the red paint job of our test car, so much nicer than those drab metallic greys so many GM products seem to get stuck with. Standard engine is a 3.1 litre V6 and it's one of those GM engines we've praised before on this show. It develops 135 horsepower and combines refinement with excellent throttle response. On the minor side it does seem a bit full throttle. The only transmission you can get with this engine is a four-speed automatic, and that's the way most people would order one anyway. The Cutlass will hit 100 kilometers per hour in about nine seconds. The fuel economy is in 9.7 liters per 100 kilometers range for all-around work. Our loaded test car stick it out at a substantial $28,337. For quite a large car, it handles well, aided by all-round independent suspension. It stops predictably too, with anti-lock disc brakes on all four wheels and the front pair vented to enhance performance. Other mechanical attributes include power-assisted rack and pinion steering, which provided quite good feel without being overly light. You won't find a bigger cabin in this class, and it's also pleasantly light and airy. There's lots of headroom front and back, and the car is easy to get in and out of. For a change, there's lots of useful stowage, including very handy seat back pockets. Instrumentation is a blend of digital and analog. The dials might look as though they have proper needles flickering up and down, but the entire panel is formed by a CRT screen. It does work quite well, and tachometer needle response seems much better than you normally get with digital colored hands. Our International came with a wide range of power conveniences. I loved the way you could open the doors and trunk with key mounted buttons before you even reach the car. A real step forward, this one. Our car also had incredible power seats with more adjustments than anything else on the market in my experience. Not only do they move back and forth, but they have power lumbar, thigh and side bolster adjustment. Even the headrests can be power controlled for maximum comfort. Added to this was very luxurious grey leather trim. Other extras included cruise control, power windows and mirrors, a power sunroof and various other electronic conveniences. The climate control panel, with everything mounted on it, including the rear window demist switch, must be the best in the business. The Cutlass battles it out in a crowded market slot, so I'll just mention some of the more obvious rivals. Beside the GM clones of this car built by Chevrolet, Pontiac and Buick, the Lumina Grand Prix and Regal, there's the Ford Taurus, and Mercury Sable, together with the Chrysler Acclaim. From Japan, there's the Honda Accord, Toyota Camry, Nissan Stanza, and Subaru Legacy. Some cash can be saved by buying a Hyundai Sonata, and there's also VW's excellent Passat. Well, Ted, I loved this one as much as I hated that uh, Delta 88 we tested recently. Typical GM product. Has some good points, has a lot of bad points. I did not like those controls on the interior. They drove me absolutely crazy, and those seats I found to be really uncomfortable. I do like the size of it, because you can get a lot of people into it, and it has a very nice drivetrain. But like a lot of GM products, it has an identity crisis. This car can't make up, up its mind what it is, you know? 
Well, I don't is, know. It, I mean, is, it a, is it a sports tour? Or is it a family sedan? What is it? You it's, know, it's a sporty family sedan. Oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I should be selling these things. Uh, how could you possibly mm. not like those seats? They have they have so many adjustment directions that I couldn't count them all. Uh, everything imaginable adjusted. I mean, it'll fit anybody. The, well, the Bit problem is that the, the base seat was uncomfortable to begin with, and you can adjust it to uh, infinity. It doesn't make any difference. The problem with it was is that the the back lumbar support and the thigh supports were too harsh, and I just could not get comfortable. They were much too Firm. I know there was a lot of controls, but they didn't impress me. I just thought they were uncomfortable. Well, I, I'll go along with the fact that, you know, that there are some seats that have no adjustment at all, which are the comfortable seats uh, and don't need any, and that's, that's true. It has to be good in the first place, but I thought the seats were very you good. Could get, a, a company like Volvo or Saab will give you some seats that have minimal adjustments, and they're perfect as soon as you sit in them. This one had adjustments forever, and it still, it still wasn't that good. But I still regard these seats as state-of-the-art, and I know a lot of uh, people who suffer from back pain and this sort of thing really love these seats, because you can change the position in, in degrees mm -hmm. and save yourself a lot of trouble. Well, the people that typically buy this car probably have one of those pop-up footstools too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. The, the controls on this thing, the wipers took forever to sort of uncoil themselves. When they go like this, it takes forever. They come back down again and you think, are they going to break this time or are they actually going to work, you know? Well, <laughs> I've said before, there's no wipers. Mercedes makes the best wipers in their business. When they have one blade, it comes wiper, wiper, right? One of them and uh, that's wonderful. But this car has lots of room. It has great uh, fittings. A lot of, lot of car for the money. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me sum up here. Um, I didn't like the confusion over the name, a, a point that I think has, has hit cutlass sales, and I hated that black shiny plastic uh, tail panel, and I thought the price was a little bit high. On the plus side, the engine was wonderful, and so was the gearbox. There were lots of features for the money, and the steering was very good. Driving dollar value, I give this one seven-eighths of a tank, an excellent car.